Shalom, Chevra. It's a delight to be here with Rabbi Yoni Rosenzweig, who's a community rabbi of the Netzach Menashe community in Beit Shemesh, a teacher at Midrash at Lindenbaum, the author of several books. He's currently working on a book related to halachic approaches to halakha and mental illness. Rabbi Yoni, thank you for taking time. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Mental illness is, of course, um, uh, such a hugely important issue, and yet one that uh, not many rabbis have the, the depths of expertise in. I wonder what, it, what inspired you to delve so deeply into this realm? Um, mental health uh, is something which I would say is recognized in halachic writings uh, quite early on. Uh, we do have even references in the Tanakh, in the, in the Bible, uh, to, uh, to cases where people were suffering from certain mental illnesses and the Gemara certainly deals with it. But two things. Number one, it was the knowledge, of course, that existed at the time was still fairly rudimentary. Um, and therefore, the field uh, is fairly un underdeveloped uh, con in comparison with what exists now and the kind of questions that people have. Um, and that's number one. And number two, uh, even amongst mental health professionals, forget, for, for, forget the Jewish world for a second, I think any mental health uh, professional uh, will tell you that the field is still quite vague, meaning in terms of its conclusions, in terms of the things that it's willing to say with great certainty. Uh, people always say, if you get like two Jews in a room, you have like three opinions. So if you get uh, two psychiatrists in a room, you'll get, I don't know, four or five opinions. It's, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to get a clear answer uh, about certain things, but the questions are real, meaning people do have questions, they do have issues that they need to uh, get resolved. And when people start asking me questions as a community rabbi, I realized that the tools at my disposal were, were not sufficient at all. There are basically no tools. Uh, look for a book today about halacha and mental illness. And I'm not saying you'll find nothing, but you'll find almost nothing. I don't want to take away from those who have already written. They certainly have written things and they were pioneers in their field, but the field has not even close to been uh, uh, covered uh, in terms of the gamut of things that need to be discussed. So that I would say is the main thing that led me to deal with it. Beautiful. So in writing a systematic halakhic analysis about mental health, what's your goal? Like, what do you, like, how do you want to move this forward in the coming five years, let's say? Um, I, first of all, when I speak to rabbis about uh, these sorts of things, they always tell me, you can't know for sure, and it's very vague, and this and that, and how could you really decide such a thing, and 100%, right? That's The goal is for rabbis to feel like mental uh, health is the same as physical health in terms of their ability to give answers, and I say specifically to give leniencies, because when it comes to physical health, uh, we have many leniencies in place to take care of those people so that they can reach full uh, uh, physical health and keep the mitzvahs, keep the Torah, keep the commandments, you know, like a regular physical, physically um, uh, um, uh, healthy person can, right? So if a person is suffering, chas v'shalom, suffering from, if it's a cancer or something even less, right? It's just a, a regular fever or the flu or whatever it is, um, we, we absolve that person from having to keep certain halachas. Today, a person comes and says, I'm depressed. The rabbi doesn't know to tell the person, okay, so you're depressed and therefore what? Like you're walking, you're talking, I see you, you're here, you come to shul. Why should I, uh, why should I absolve you of anything? You're, you seem like you're fine to me, yeah? So people don't understand mental illness. They understand the words. They understand the word depression. They understand that the person is suffering on some level. They don't understand how real it is to the extent that they can say, well, let's abrogate some halachas, you know, for you to get better, for you to become, you know, more self-sufficient. So my goal, I would say, in the next five years, if I had to, I would say that the, this book that I'm writing and the work that I'm doing, hopefully, will lead um, uh, you know rabbinic professionals to understand uh, that these things are real and that there is a real need to challenge um, sometimes the halacha uh, in order to help these individuals reach full competence. Beautiful, beautiful. So some people talk about anivut of humility as not taking up too much space and not taking up too little space, taking up your proper amount of space. What's the proper amount of space for the rabbinic field in relationship to mental health professionals when dealing with congregants living with mental illness? 
Because um, rabbis have obviously a huge role that many are not willing to step into, but also limitations on that role, right? Of course, of course. Um, that is one of the main questions, right? Is what is the role of the rabbi within, this, within, within all of this? So let's be clear. The rabbi is the decider. In other words, he, he is the one who gives the psak, let's call it, the halachic decision, uh, the practical decision. But he can't give that practical decision without consulting the professionals, without, consult, without having all the information uh, you know, in his pocket, right? So he needs to have that information. Without that, he can't, he can't do anything. Uh, and that's the challenge over here. I can tell you that any time that I approached a, uh, a mental health professional with a question uh, and I asked him, you know, what would you say, right? What would you say I can do in such, in, in such a case? They would always say the same answer. Every case is different. Each case must be evaluated differently, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the POSEC, the halachic decider, cannot uh, work with that. That's not an answer we can work with. We need clear rules, clear definitions, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If you tell us, oh, each case is different, great, then, great, then what have I done? Yeah? So in order to write this book, I actually had to make up, to some extent, a new halachic language, a language that was able to accept, on the one hand, the, um, I guess, the diversity of cases uh, and the diversity of um, of how things um, 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 are exhibited, right, from person to person, to be able to keep that diversity within the text, within the words, which usually quantify and give give something strict. And with that, to get with all that diversity, to give a clear direction, a clear line, a clear way of thinking about this from halachic terms, so that the person reading this can say, "Oh, okay, so this is what I must." do right and figuring out that language figuring out that middle that ability to on the one hand maintain the integrity of the mental health field yeah which basically says look you really can't judge from one person to another and they don't have biological markers the way there, there is in physical in the, in the realm of physical health yeah where there are clear logical markers that help you decide what medicine to give or what uh, treatment to give or what uh, direction to go in so to maintain once again that uh, that uh, the integrity of the mental health field, but with that, to give people the tools to say, okay, I can't, but I, but I can quantify this, but I will be able to define this in some way. It will help me come to a clear cut decision to be able to help this person. Because if I'm always in doubt, but maybe he's not sick, but maybe he is sick, but maybe he's more sick, but maybe he's less sick. If I'm always in doubt about that, and I won't know because it's all in his head, so I don't really know what he's feeling, how will I be able to help him? So I had to come up with a language that will assist the rabbi to make sense of what the me mental health professional is saying in order to move forward. And one last thing on this, which is that as a result of that, uh, the entire book, it doesn't say this, but, but anyone who reads it understands, you can't move without discussing, without consultation. It's not a book that a rabbi can just pass in from, can just rule from without discussing first, at least with the patient, but if possible, also with the mental health professional. It, because otherwise, he won't know how to relate to the specific person. So even though the, the book is, is still, the terms are, are, that are used are clear-cut, but if you look at the book, you'll see you really can't move anywhere without there being a dialogue between the rabbi and the psychologist slash psychiatrist. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so it takes a lot of work to, care, to take care of people. It takes a lot of work. You got to know, got to know the facts on the ground. You got to listen. You have to partner. So um, um, the you know, oftentimes when we want to show Chazal's sophistication about mental illness, we talk about suicide. Say, so, ah, oh, you know, of course that in theory suicide, uh, you you're denied burial, denied mourning, all this stuff. But Chazal understood that clearly something was happening in the internal life. Um, do we give Chazal too much credit or too little credit on their understanding here? I mean, because it's not a critique. They're, they're living in pre-modern times. They don't have the language and, you know, academic research we have today. And yet there seems to be something going on there. How do you, how do you relate the Chazal's understanding of what we're dealing with today? Right. So Chazal um, were very wise and very sage, but they're mostly in their field. And their understanding of the psyche was obviously – you know, I guess compared to their time was very, very nice and very good, but obviously underdeveloped. And not just them, I would say they're no different than the rest of the world at that time. So they were obviously unable to understand uh, completely the inner workings 
of what was going on uh, with someone with a mental illness. And therefore, what we see in Chazal, and you mentioned suicide, and that's a good example, what we see in Chazal is an understanding of the extreme cases of mental illness, meaning they can definitely tell what's going on with the person to say, oh, he's, uh, excuse the non-political correctness, to say he's mad, he's nuts, he's crazy. Yeah, to say something like that, yeah, uh, to what we call a shote, yeah, in the terms that the Mishnah uses, the Gemara uses. That, what does that term mean? It means someone who is patently, obviously, not acting the way that what we would call normal people uh, are acting. Right, so they could sit, they could tell that they could see that, and suicide for them was the penultimate act of 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 someone who's illogical, who's doing something that is not only against halacha but against the the very calling of I would say the the natural instinct that a person has. So Chazal were very good, I would say, very good at 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 noticing those cases, the extreme cases, but to notice and to develop a clear. Uh, taxonomy of like you know like what's going on with like with the middle with the gray that they didn't know and they they didn't have the ability they didn't have the tools you know to do that so I don't know if we're giving them too much credit you know they definitely could see that those were things that they could see and they could they could really tell they could pinpoint you know but I'm not sure they were different from the rest of the world in that sense uh, but obviously they did not understand the inner workings of the mind, you know, to the extent that they could also tell gray cases from, from black and white. Right, right. So it feels like these last two weeks have been like the pinnacle of halachic response to mental illness. And uh, I wonder how have the effects of coronavirus and social distancing supported or challenged some of your conclusions? How will it change the way we approach mental health in the Orthodox community? What do you see happening from your vantage point right now in this moment of crisis? Um, so that's a good question, 100%. Um, obviously, these times, uh, these corona times, have been difficult for people um, in terms of uh, loneliness, being alone. Um, and those things definitely, in and of themselves, um, are, are difficult from a mental health perspective. Uh, they, of course, exacerbate uh, existing, existing conditions um, as well and especially amongst the elderly. You know, I think that because of the tragedy of, uh, of suicide amongst the youth, okay, when someone young takes their life or chas v'shalom or does drugs or things of that sort, um, and then they, they, they uh, you know, they have an untimely passing, uh, I think it's very tragic. And so those things get the limelight. But I think if you look at the statistics, you'll see that suicide amongst the elderly is I think higher than uh, amongst the uh, amongst the youth, and that's less known because when someone is when someone is elderly and depressed, it is kind of like assumed that that's a natural occurrence. People just assume, oh, you're old, so of course you're depressed. Like, what what do you expect? Yeah, you're not young and vibrant like me. So then, you know, obviously your life is a bit slower, and then that's just you know you, you get the blues, you know, etc. But even though depression may be a little bit common. It is by no means natural amongst the elderly. And the mistake that we make is to think that it is. And the coronavirus has really heightened that problem because here's the thing. We, we all understand on a, on, a, on, a, on a moral, ethical level that uh, we have to help those who are most in need. And our parents and grandparents, you know, at this point, because of their vulnerability to the virus, are most in need. And yet, at the same time, our helping them is exactly what we cannot do. Meaning we can't go there, we can't be with them, we can't be next to them because we don't want to give it to them. And so we're kind of like, you know, in the middle of this like uh, catch 22 that we don't know what to do. Um, and that actually creates a real mental health issue because um, like I said, uh, I spoke to a doctor and because people were asking me about, let's say using uh, Zoom in order to uh, Zoom people into the Seder. I'm sure you've heard this question yourself. You know, can you uh, use electronic means in order to make a, 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 a Passover night together uh, with your, you know, with your parents or grandparents, you know, et cetera, that you don't want them to be alone? Uh, if they're living together, wonderful. But if they're like apart, right, you know, if they're divorced or one of them has passed, it's even worse to be alone, et cetera. And it's a very family oriented night. Can you leave it on from before the, from before the Chag comes in, from before Passover comes in in order to, you know, go throughout, you know, et cetera, and you can connect. Can you can, so. I spoke to, uh, 
to one of the head doctors here, uh, one of the head of a psychiatric hospital here in Israel about the possibility of what that might do if you didn't have that, if you didn't, uh, you know, like have that connection. And he said it would definitely increase morbidity um, in terms of depression, uh, which basically, if I translate that into layman's terms, would mean that people who don't have it, you know, depression might develop it. Those who have depression, it might be exacerbated. Uh, and depression is a very, very difficult thing to deal with um, and is definitely something that people don't realize. They just think, oh, the person will be a little bit lonely. But what, how is depression, I'm just sorry if I'm using a little bit technical terms, but how, how is depression, uh, how is it instigated? How does it start? It starts when a person is faced with his own mortality, when the person is, feels isolated, when he has lack of mobility. That usually refers to like, you know, that he can't physically do certain things, but here he's stuck in the house. It's the same idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have people dying right and left, chas v'shalom, you know, et cetera. Maybe even people that he knows, friends, you know, or acquaintances, maybe even family. I mean, all those things for an elderly person who's at risk, who's right now, you know, immunocompromised, I mean, that exacerbates the situation significantly. And people don't realize that. That's the problem. They think, oh, he'll be lonely. So what's the, what's the big deal? So he'll be a little bit lonely. It's not nice, not great, but like, what's the story here? And here's exactly where our understanding of mental health needs to come in in order to help us evaluate the reality correctly. Yeah. In fact, I wonder if sometimes we make the mistake religiously of exoticizing um, and giving spiritual depth to loneliness. Uh, look, I, I've, I've loved the Rub's Lonely Man of Faith, but there are lots of sources that can indicate loneliness is a good thing. You find a Kaddish Baruch Hu in your loneliness, right? You find the depths of your neshama. But in fact, even for introverts, right, so we're social beings who need connection. And so um, it's, it's really important that Hever out there take this really seriously um, of what it means to be at risk. So last question for you. When is your book out? And will you be speaking in the U.S.? Uh, will you be accessible to speak in other countries, uh, you know, on these topics? Um, I don't know exactly. The coronavirus has kind of uh, <laughs> has, has, has mixed everybody's plans up. I'm not sure when the book is out. I wanted it to be out by the end of this year. I hope that that will still happen. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, most of the work is already done. You know, so I hope that's true. As far as like a speaking tour, that is my plan. And uh, God willing, also in America, that is the plan. Okay. Wishing you lots of bracha and hatzlacha. Thank you. Only health for everybody. Amen. Amen.